publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatchett. It is a Friday, if you're listening on release day. We have an interview with a really interesting new uh, company, a startup, a couple of years old now, but pivoted recently into sort of a new technology era to help authors. So more on that in a moment. Um, But before we do that, I just wanted to talk about advertising uh, for a little bit, because that's kind of our core subject here at Learn Self-Publishing. We've just been working on an update of one of our courses, a module, Facebook Ads for Authors. And um, I work with Facebook ads all the time, for, with all the paid ads all the time, not just for me and my books. I have two frames of reference. I guess one is my books that I spend um, a couple of hundred quid a week probably on ads. Let's have a look how much have I spent in the last week. 200, actually nearly 300 pounds in the last seven days, but I only have two and a half books. Um, so uh, it's relatively small fry. I make a profit. I'm quite proud of the fact I make a profit on that, not a huge amount of profit, but uh, it gives me uh, a lot of experience of, of running ads to a kind of nitty level and eking out profit where we can. My bigger frame of reference, of course, is Vinci Books, where we spend tens of thousands of pounds every month, uh, primarily on Facebook, but we are growing our Amazon ad spend as well. And uh, the one thing I wanted to say about it is I think that Amazon, uh, Facebook ads in particular were were expensive and performing more poorly uh, for most of this year until the last eight weeks or so. In the last eight weeks, things have really looked up. We had our best month ever last year, last year, last month in Vinci. Uh, I had a good month with my own books and that has continued so far. So I'm just wondering what that's about. Um, We expect it to get a little easier in the summer and it is obviously expensive in the autumn, but I would have expected it to have got better in January and February, traditionally not big spend month for other companies. Uh, Now, what do I mean by that? Because I talk about this quite a lot about uh, whether there's other money in the market. And it stands to reason that the way these ad platforms are set up is you end up bidding for a space. And if there are 150 people including some big spenders, corporate companies that uh, perhaps are after awareness rather than really metric and measuring their their results. So they're happy to throw more money at those campaigns. Then you're going to be competing against them for the same space. And inevitably, your cost per advert is going to go up and your cost per click and so on, or your metrics, uh, or you're not going to get served at all, your inefficient adverts. And... Um, Conversely, if they pull money out of the system, they're quiet times, which we get sort of between Christmas and New Year's quite quiet. The middle of summer, I find, is quite quiet. The beginning of the year, February is normally quite a good month. That didn't happen this year. Then we get to make hay while that sun shines. Now, it's been good for the last eight weeks or so. I don't really know why it suddenly changed and why it was difficult. We do know that Meta, I'm talking about Facebook ads, but I should really say Meta, I suppose, had some sort of change to their system, internal change to their system. They haven't confirmed this, but it was widely reported on. There's actually an article floating around on Business Insider that said uh, everything's been ruined for Facebook advertisers. It's so expensive now. Big companies complaining actually about it, that that ads just weren't as effective anymore. I suspect this is to do with the move Meta are making towards a sort of AI version of targeting called Advantage Plus, where they give you fewer choices and they make the choices for you. I guess this is driven by them thinking they know the customers better, um, which might be the case uh, and might address an issue that lots of advertisers have, which is they start advertising on Facebook. They don't really get into it. They don't see the results within the first few weeks or months. And so they give up and never come back to the platform. And they might be trying to solve that and say, look, we will serve your ads for you because we know, as long as we know roughly what your product is, we will find your customers. And I'm quite keen on that system, wide advertising, or whatever you want to call it, Advantage Plus. I think it is definitely worth using, and I definitely do use that. But there's also usually benefit from being able to grind out those targets to find your audience, which we've always done on Facebook and with particular genres, using particular interests, and mine in particular, because it's 
Cold War jets. I can find people who like Cold War jets and like Kindle, for instance. I'm not sure Advantage Plus does that as well as I do it. Um, and the same applies through other genres as well. So I would hope in the long term, and if Meta are listening to this, that they always give us those choices under the hood, if you like, which is where they are now, actually, when you first go into it, it's why we've redone the Ads for Authors uh, module on Facebook ads uh, in the last few weeks is because actually the on the face of it, it's changed. The reality is I don't think it's changed a lot underneath because at the moment it just looks like you have Advantage Plus everything. Advantage Plus will... will do the placements. That is where your ad's going to appear in the meta ecosystem. Advantage Plus will do the targeting, i.e. who it's going to be served at. But actually, you can dismiss a lot of these. It's not always obvious how you can dismiss it, but uh, you can find a sort of hidden button uh, just to the right and you can click manual or I'll do this myself and, and you can choose all of those things as we used to, uh, which is still something I do most of the time, but I do actually run Advantage Plus here and there as well. Never on placements, by the way. I think there are some places, in fact, there are a lot of places in the meta ecosystem that just are not good for books. Books are not high value enough to be placed. And it, you know, some of the stories, some of the more uh, ephemeral, is that the right word, the sort of fleeting appearances on timelines when people just skip past them too quickly. I don't think they do much good for people who are about to buy a book, but on a Facebook news feed or an Instagram news feed, I think a prime territory and always have been. So I try to narrow my advertising uh, to those. You'll learn about that in the course. If, you, um, if you're in the Ads for Authors uh, program, you'll get that module very soon. Um, but I am wondering whether there's some elections about, there's quite a lot of elections about actually. There's uh, UK, we're having a, a general election. Uh, in the US, there's a general election this year as well. And their uh, campaigning is, uh, appears to have started. We're having big European elections at the moment, and that might be a reason for bigger companies not to be advertising much at the moment. They might assume they'll be crowded out for attention by uh, political money coming in. I actually thought when they announced the UK election that our prices would go up because I think Facebook is a fertile territory um, for political advertising, although Facebook does make it more difficult to advertise politically now. But the re reality is it seems to have coincided with a cheaper period. So maybe the high profile elections everywhere have driven out some of the big spenders for now. So if you weren't running Facebook ads over the last few weeks, now might be the time to spark up those campaigns again and just have a look at what sort of cost per click you're getting. Um, uh, well, not, not necessarily cost per click, of course, what kind of results you're getting, uh, I should say, um, for uh, some bang for your buck. So it's not the golden years of five years ago, um, but it is certainly better than it was three or four months ago, I would say, in Facebook advertising for certain. Um, OK, so I just wanted to talk about that just for a little bit, because I know it's something that we do discuss all the time. Um, so we have a few days left. Let's see when this is going out. This podcast is going to go out. It's the 10th as I'm recording this. Monday, it's going to go out on the 14th, which means you have a week left if you want to come to the self-publishing show live in London. I'd love you to be there. Come and say hello and uh, listen to what we're talking about. Uh, on London South Bank on the 25th and 26th of June. Uh, you can even watch the England game in the evening with us uh, if you're so inclined, or you can just ignore it, uh, turn your back to the TV and have a beer. Um, yeah, so we are going to wrap up sales for tickets on the 21st, gives us seven days or so to sort out, six days to sort out everything we need to sort out in terms of seating before the conference starts. So the 21st of June will be the last day you can buy tickets for the self-publishing show live. And you can do that today. Why wait to the 21st? By going to learnselfpublishing.com forward slash SPS live. Okay, right. Well, we have an interview. I told you it's, an, it's a startup. So it's a company you may not have heard of, but uh, they've got a catchy name. You'll probably remember it's called Dibley, dibley.com, D-I-B-L-Y.com. Uh, on the face of it, they look to be a, uh, a marketplace for talent uh, in self-publishing, uh, indie publishing, so cover designers and creators. Uh, you may have heard of Reedy.com, so I guess a competitor to them, maybe a slightly different slant on things. But they have a very interesting um, founder who we're going to talk to, a man called Marco Mountino. And Marco is very into new technology. So by the way, if you're anti-AI, turn away now because this company is going to be, I think, all in on AI. So they have built some assistance within their platform to help you create uh, and use the latest technology to speed that process up and uh, take away the blank page 
as they say. Uh, it's a little bit complicated to, uh, to explain. Uh, I think it's called KIP, their uh, AI helper. Uh, but this is in addition to it being a marketplace, this tool that you can subscribe to where you can basically write your novel and have some help at all those various stages and pain points that we've had in the past. So uh, a quite exciting prospect for novelists. I'll let Marco explain more and then I'll be back for a quick chat uh, before I say goodbye. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Marco Martino, welcome to the Self Publishing Show. Hope I said your surname correctly though. Ma Martino. You did. Oh, there you go. Motino. Yeah. I'm in, I'm nice. in for a winning start. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, look, Marco, it's great to have you here on the show. Uh, you are one of the men behind Dibley, one of the guys behind Dibley which I don't know a huge amount about, but I'm really looking forward to learning about it. It sounds like it's going to be something that could uh, benefit the indie author community. But why don't you start with a bit about yourself and, yes. uh, and the company? Awesome. Well, thanks, uh, James, for having me here. Um, so, you know, we have a pretty deep history. Um, I'll just start with myself. So my background is in software engineering. I graduated college here back in, so we're from Canada, by the way, uh, close to Toronto. And I graduated back in 2015. And then ever since, I've, I've worked on various different projects, worked, worked uh, with various different companies. Um, but ultimately, I ended up in the self-publishing space. Now, I'm not a writer. I'm not an author. I'm mainly, when I started my self-publishing journey, I was more of a marketer. And I looked for hot topics that people were interested in reading about, and there wasn't a lot of book content around it. And what I did is I would outsource that content to ghostwriters and then I would publish it, market it. And that's how I built a business. This was back in 2017. I, well, sorry, I started in 2017. By the time uh, I got to 2018, uh, achieved some success. And I realized that a lot of companies, a lot of these ghostwriting companies that we used weren't very good. Um, you kind of just would submit what you were wanting them to work on. And then like three weeks to a month later, you just get this book and it, if it wasn't good, it wasn't good. And it's too bad. It's on you kind of situation. Uh, so I set on a mission to change that. And that's when I started the urban writers, which still exists today. When I built the company though, I called it Dibley Inc. And the reason why I called it Dibley Inc or Dibley, I should say, is because I wanted a just like one name, didn't really have a meaning to it, and I wanted it to just be very rememberable, very creative. Um, and so that's, I don't, don't ask me exactly how I stumbled on that name. It just happened to be that. Uh, so, so the Urban Writers, till this day, is, uh, has been very successful. Um, and now we're rebranding. So we're turning the Urban Writers, which used to be a ghost ran company, which is now a lot more. It's comparable to Upwork or Freelancer or Fiverr, where you can come in, find content. And sorry, specifically for content. Come in, find content creators, and they can create content for you, whether it's for editing, writing, uh, cover design, uh, illustrations, narration, translation. We cover a very wide scope. And it's your freelancers. You work with them. And it's a platform where we host uh, you post your project, etc. cetera. Um, and with this, this business, um, we used to use Google Docs. And Google Docs kind of, kind of, we gave the control to Google in terms of controlling the content and having a third party access that content. And because content was so, such a big core of our service, because that's all we worked on, uh, we decided to build our own tool. And that's where Dilly Create was born. And we started this back in, I think we're in 2024, so September of 2022. Uh, recently did a, a launch. And um, because of the whole AI movement, we've integrated AI deeply into it. And we have a little, a little pal called Kip. We've named, we've named it Kip. And Kip is fully integrated with very cool tools that will help the author journey, help you write, help you brainstorm, uh, get rid of uh, writer's block, right? Just it's a very intuitive, easy to use tool all in one place. And um, yeah, it was interesting how it kind of developed because it was meant just to be as a, a platform that we use to control the content so that 
our customers are safe. Our freelancers can only use this and no third party. And then with the release of AI, just turned into this whole other um, software that we didn't originally anticipate. Okay. So, so that's, that's just like a very high level overview. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. So you've got a, a kind of marketplace, but for content creators, and it feels very geared around the indie publishing space. I mean, that's kind of uh, yes type of people we get on there. And I'm assuming it's going to be a bit like um, Fiverr you mentioned in that you can see ratings and you, you know, you can you get exactly. a, kind of, a judgment of quality or whether it's going to be the right service for you. Um, exactly. Yeah. Which sort of brings value to it. Otherwise, you know, it's always that difficult question is, is, you know, someone's been recommended to you, but are they going to be the right person for you, et cetera? Yeah. Okay. So you've got that. And we do, I do want to mention James that we do vet every freelancer that comes in. So okay. unlike Fiverr and Upwork, anybody can kind of jump in there and start building a profile. Every single freelancer is vetted on our end. Yeah. And then you created this effectively, is this, is this, I mean, explain it to me a bit, in a bit more detail, is this something you could write your novel in this writing tool? Absolutely. Yep. So we built it exactly for that. So the base of it was designed for authors. So you can even fully format it. So we built a, a very, something similar to Vellum, um, where once your book content is done, you've written all the chapters, you can now go and nicely format it for uh, ebook, for paperback, and then get that final draft ready for publication. You can invite collaborators in. They can start editing. Uh, we have suggestion mode similar to Google Docs. It's extremely collaborative. Um, yeah, and we're, we're working on something called um, a beta reader view. So you'll be able to share it with your audience in a very specific view, where then you can collect, they can leave feedback directly there. You have one place, almost like a survey, but it's all within where you create your content, where you create your book. Um, and you're getting this like feedback, shareable link, view only, and it's all in one place. And you can even have Kip kind of collect that data for you, analyze it, let you know what people are saying, and give you um, improvement suggestions. So that's something we're working on. Um, yeah, it's really cool. Okay. Yeah. And one of the things that always strikes me about this is that editors, I mean, it sounds ideal to me that, you know, an editor, you could just say here's the project and, and invite your collaborator and they can edit it. But a lot of editors are quite fussy about, oh, I need it in Word, format, double space, Times New Roman, 12 point. Right. Can you also use it like that? You could export it, for instance. Yep. Yes. So we do have, if you, if you don't want to use the formatting tool, you just want to export to Word. Yep. You can just export it to Word, give it to whoever's editing, and then they can go from there. And how, how do you keep your, I mean, obviously you can export your stuff, but I'm assuming it's up in the cloud and backed up and there needs to be a bit of security for the authors around that, that they're not um, leaving their manuscripts open to anybody else. Yeah. Yeah. So it's completely, um, everything that you put in, there's a login system. Uh, we're using industry standard security system to make sure that it's not hackable. Um, it's in the cloud using AWS, big providers. So it's not like something that we've built. Um, so security is very important for us in terms of sharing. You can only share, you have sharing options and it's only to the email that you send access to. So only that individual can see it. Um, everything is backed up. So we actually have multiple backup systems so that if something does happen, internet drops, whatever the case may be, um, we do have backups and if for whatever reason, cause we have a version history where you can go back just in case you lose something, uh, we, we track everything for you, uh, for whatever reason, something disappears. We have multiple backup systems that we can retrieve from as well as an offline mode. So if you're somewhere, internet connection is not great. It's okay. It's going to store directly on your computer. And as soon as you're back online, it's going to sync it with our cloud system. And uh, if anybody else is connected, they're going to get your changes and vice versa. So, yeah, we've, we've built it very, very secure, very intuitive, um, allow, allows you to just work away similar like you would with Google Docs. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and you've got some AI built in. So Kip, your little, uh, I can see him on the website, the little robot, I guess, uh, walking across the screen uh, here. That's that one. Yes. Kip. Um, and so in terms of, yes. of integration with the writing 
how does that work? And is it something you can choose to opt in with or opt out of? Yeah. So uh, we did build, we built in a way to actually disable KIP. So let's say, for example, you're working on a project, uh, you have some collaborators and you want nobody using KIP on that project. There is an option to disable KIP and then all the KIP options that would normally show up are gone. So anybody in there no longer has access to KIP. So we did, we built that in. Um, But in terms of working with KIP, there's various ways. So, for example, you can highlight a piece of text and ask Kip to do something on it, change the style, change the point of view, uh, enrich the content, check for grammar mistakes, um, formatting options. Uh, You can you have a chat version of Kip where you're communicating similar to chat GPT. So you're doing like a back and forth, whether it's a brainstorming session, uh, asking Kip to generate an image for you. You can even ask Kip to find a freelancer for you because it's connected to our database of freelancers. So, and then let's say you brainstorm some ideas, you can insert that content right into your editor space with a click of a button. Um, And then um, you can generate content with, we have a slash kip command, you can generate content right in line. We also have a huge list of prompts um, that we've personally designed. I think we're, we're getting close to about 70 high quality prompts and it varies from uh, creating stories, helping you build out your characters, uh, to like marketing material, um, keywords, a- ads. So it, it's it's quite wide. Um, and then you can use that in your projects. And then the last thing you can do with Kip is we've we've created a whole bunch of different tools, highly specialized tools to do various things. For example, we have an outline generator tool, and you give Kip. A couple of uh, whether it could be vague or very explicit as to how you want the outline to be. And then Kip will generate this entire outline for you. And we have it for nonfiction and fiction. And we use different strategies. You can upload your entire book and ask Kip to generate a description for you. And again, we use a different strategy for fiction and nonfiction. Uh, We have research and research covers. There's three variations for Amazon. So we have category. Uh, search term analysis, and then we have in-depth book uh, book analysis. We have Google and YouTube. And essentially what those do for Amazon, we're looking at, for the most part, the customer review. So say you have a competitor and you want to beat the competitor because you want to create a better book and you want to look at what customers are actually asking for, what they like, what they don't like, you can use our in-depth book analysis tool. It's going to scrape 500 reviews from that book And Kip is going to analyze it and give you uh, feedback. Okay, this is what customers liked about it. This is what customers didn't like about it. This is how your book can stand out based off this information. And you can even ask Kip questions during this process if you want to further analyze uh, the data. And similarly with YouTube and Google, we're looking at articles for Google and YouTube, we're looking at videos. So it, it lends itself really well if you're doing some type of research. Uh, maybe you're building a, or you're working on a nonfiction book and I don't know, um, uh, chair yoga is like a big trend right now. So let's say you want to get some exercise ideas and you want to use YouTube and Google to see what's what's popular, you can do that. Um, and then uh, we have Summarizer, which can take an entire book, file, whatever the case may be, you can ask questions about it and it can give you an overview of that content. I think you can, I think the max that we support is 60,000 word files. Um, and then we have a biographer title generator that's going into Amazon, looking at categories and seeing other titles and giving you ideas for your titles. And the last tool we have is content writer and content writer is right now it supports only nonfiction, but we're building a fiction version and essentially it can help you write the base of your chapter. You put your chapter outline in and it's meant to complement our outline generator. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and what engine do you use for this? I'm assuming you haven't built your own AI. Do you plug into ChatGPT or Claude or? Yeah. So uh, for most of it, we use OpenAI. Uh, so we use GPT-4, GPT-3.5. Um, and then we also use other models. Um, we're looking at Llama 3 and uh, Stable Diffusion. Uh, we're using it for the image generation. Uh, so there's various different models that we use. 
and then we tie it all together um, to make Kip work really well. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds a, a very modern, um, bang up to date approach to writing. Of course, it's controversial. There'll be some people listening to this saying, well, you know, we're up against people using AI to, to generate books by the, the gazillion every week. Uh, right. Our differentiator yeah. is that we're humans writing books, but I think that's what this is. It exactly. prompts to help you not taking over the writing. Exactly. And, and that's, I, I think there is, like you said, this whole like black and white, it's either like you're all for AI or you completely hate it. And that middle ground is, is, is hard. Some people are seeing it. Some people, most people aren't. And I think AI, you have to look at it as a tool, just like, um, any other tool in your tool belt that you use for writing, like, uh, like your word processor, that's just a tool. Uh, if you use Grammarly, right. It's just a tool to help you with editing, but it didn't put editors out of a job. Yeah. Now, AI is extremely powerful, yes. And I do believe that you have to leverage AI right now. Like you have, it's not going anywhere, it's here. And so take advantage. It's a tool, it's not replacing you. You are the human, you are the expert, you are the creative mind. AI is not creative. AI only knows what it's been told and it can't really create anything out of thin air. It's always, it has um, some reference that it used to create that, whether it's a reference you pass in or it's a reference it's been trained on. And so that's how we have to think. It's like, I'm the creator, but maybe I'm not typing as much, but I'm still creating. I'm just leveraging this tool to do that portion for me. Yeah. And I think that's important that people need to realize. Yeah, like it. I uh, just had a quick look at the pricing. So there's a pricing option and I'll let you describe that those, um, but there's also a free option. Uh, can you tell, talk yes. about the two plans and what people would, would experience if they just use the free one? Yeah. So the free version is essentially would work very similar to Google docs. Um, you would have a place to store your projects. You would have, uh, write all your books. Everything would be free. The only difference between the free version and the paid version is the types of tools you ac have access to and how many tokens to use with Kip you get. So on the free version, for example, you get 20,000 tokens a month. And that, that will give you maybe, uh, let's say, 25,000 words that you can generate with Kip, give or take. Um, but one thing to consider is the words that you input into Kip as well. So whatever you ask Kip to do, whatever you prompt include is included in that word count. Okay. So that's something you have to be mindful. Uh, so, so at the free version, you can pretty much do everything limited access in terms of how many tokens, and then, um, you don't have access to the pro tools. So you don't have access to the outline generator the research tool, the summarizer, the content writer. So that's exclusive to pro. Um, and we just launched a way to buy tokens. So if you don't want to subscribe, but you just want to use Kip because uh, you're on the free version, let's say uh, you still won't get access to the pro tools, but you get access to everything else. You get access to our prompt library. You get access to chat Kip. You get access to the highlight and the in content writing of Kip. So it's everything. It's just, how many tokens you get? Very limited. So it's 20,000 versus a million on the base subscription. Um, and then uh, I think the only other difference is with the free version, you can only export to Word. Okay. And there, the, the pro uh, version has access to the interior book design feature that we have. Okay. Yeah. And, and then collaborators, everything else is, is the same for both. Invite any number of collaborators, contributors, etc. And the paid version is how much? So the paid version starts at 23 uh, US a month. And that will give you a million tokens, um, which depending on how you use it, it can be plenty. Uh, if you're using our pro tools, it does a lot of processing work. It does a lot of research for you requirements gathering. So a lot is happening. It does tend to use more tokens, but if you're just using chat Kip, uh, highlight Kip, the, when you highlight text or ask it to generate prompt library, a million tokens will get you very, very far. You're looking at, 
a million words, give or take. Yeah. That's enough uh, for most people. Um, and I noticed yeah. there is a yearly option if you want to save a bit of money on that, brings it down to below 20 bucks. Yeah. Do the yearly option. Yes, yeah, so you, you get two months free. Do you have to be online to use this and access your manuscript? No, you don't. As long as while you're offline. So for example, if let's say someone shared a manuscript with you, you wouldn't be able to access it unless you're online. But if it's your manuscript and you're offline, yeah, you can still access it. So you don't need to have an internet connection. Oh, okay. I'm just thinking if you're traveling somewhere and you know, sitting in a passenger seat of a car and sketchy uh, internet, you could still work on your manuscript yeah. and it syncs up presumably when it connects. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it'll store it locally and then sync up as soon as you have stable internet. Great. Well, sounds really interesting. I think a lot of people will definitely be checking this out. Um, some people of course will, uh, think that uh, Kip is the devil's work and won't be, but that's a, a matter of choice. Um, I'm intrigued by it. Uh, <laughs> so I would certainly be having a look. Um, and it's, it's not just you, Marco, is it? You've got a group of you as a, a partnership, is it all? Yeah. So I, um, Dibley, I mean, we have over 50 employees. Wow. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty big team and, um, yeah, so there's lots of us here. Um, and do you mind me asking see, if you'll you... see, sorry. No, no, I was going to say, you'll see a handful of them there at the event. Oh yeah. We'll talk about that, uh, SPS live in a second, but are you, um, have you picked up investment or are you bootstrapping this yourself? This is just a business to business question because I'm nosy. But... Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's fine. Uh, so right now, uh, pretty much self-funded. So all profits have been reinvested into the company. And that's how much, that's pretty much how, how we've been operating for the past seven years. Uh, we are looking now at funding. Uh, but so far we've been very fortunate enough to be able to self-fund. Yeah, great. Yes, and... Uh... You will be in London uh, next week, uh, next week, not next week. Actually, I'm not sure when this is going out. It might be next week, but it's certainly next month from where we're sitting here now. Uh, at SPS Live uh, on the South Bank. And uh, I think it'll be your first time to our conference. Yes. Well, uh, I personally won't be there uh, just because it, unfortunately, it conflicted with some other event that we had. It was just that's just how it ended up, but my team will be there. So we'll have our team there. Uh, we'll have a booth and we will, we will be showcasing create. Good. Well, look, that's, that's excellent. I think honestly, it's an intriguing, um, uh, product. I didn't know too much about it. I know I like its simplicity. I like that you've explained very clearly what it does and where it fits into indie authors. Um, how's it going? I mean, how's your user base? Is it growing at the rate you want? Yeah, I mean, um, we could always be like, oh, yeah, I wish it was growing even faster. Of course, sure. that's that's always uh, easy to argue. But to be to be fair, it's it's growing at a, a, a good pace. I think we just passed 10,000 users this weekend. So it is, yeah, it's growing uh, really well. Yeah, and we're getting great feedback. So great. Okay. Well, look, Marco, thank you very much. I'm sorry we're going to miss you in London, but we'll look forward to uh, catching up with your colleagues. And uh, the web address of where to find Dibley is simplicity itself. It is, it is dibley.com, right? Yes, dibley.com. Um, it's going to change, but if you want to look at create, it's dibley.com slash create. Yeah, and you can navigate to create from, from dibley.com. D-I-B-B-L-Y. Yes. Okay. Brilliant. Well, look, wish you luck with it. Uh, we'll see your colleagues in London and uh, let's stay in touch because I'll be intrigued to see how this goes in the future. Absolutely. Well, thank you, James. It's been a pleasure. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. There's Marco Mountino from dibly.com, D I B L Y.com. Fascinating, interesting. Go and have a look at Kip and make your new friend there. Uh, so I want to say thank you to Marco for coming on uh, to the show. I think if I remember rightly, he's going to be there in London as well, or at least one of his colleagues is going to be. So if you're uh, thinking about coming, you, as I said at the beginning of the show, you have a week left, uh, 21st of June, will be the last day you can buy a ticket for the self-publishing show live. If you go to learn selfpublishing.com forward slash SPS live. That's it 
from me for this week. Thank you very much indeed for listening. I hope you enjoyed your jog on the running machine at the gym or your dog walk or the washing up or whatever it is you're doing. Do tell me. I always love to hear that. Come and say hello and tell me how you listen to me. Uh, That's it. All that remains for me to say is it's a goodbye for me. So goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.